Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Would you grab hold of somebody nearby and just remind them that God is good? Two or three folks, if you can. God is good. presence today. Praise God. If you can, open your Bibles or your notepad or your cell phone app to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And today I felt led to do something a little different um, than I, I guess whatever my normal is. Uh, I don't know exactly what that is, but uh, I felt led to just share with you the story of how God got Saul of Tarsus' attention. And I think that many times he's trying to get our attention. And we need to pay attention. When he's trying to get our attention. So. I'd like to share from Acts chapter 9. And if if you don't mind. If we could just pause for prayer. Before we read God's word. Father. This is your word. And your word is quick. And sharp. Powerful. Sharper than any two edged sword. And Father, we're asking that you would use the sword of your word on us today. That you would pierce and penetrate our hearts and our minds and our understanding. And that you would do surgery on us if we need surgery. And that you would encourage us if we need encouragement. Father, that you would do whatever you desire to do through your word today. And Father, I'm asking that... You would cause your word to come alive in our hearts. We ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, this may remind us of things in our headlines today. Damascus is in our headlines today. Syria is in our headlines today. In fact, ISIS is raising up its ugly head in Syria and in Iraq today. In fact, ISIS is breathing out murderous threats just like Saul was against the believers in Jesus Christ. ISIS is now breathing out those murderous threats against the followers of Jesus Christ. But you know, right now, at the same time, we're getting testimonies, testimonies of terrorists coming to Jesus Christ, of people who have ill intent against the people of God, and all of a sudden they have a vision of Jesus. And and these are Muslim people, but they have a vision of Jesus, and all of a sudden, They're transformed, and they come to Jesus, 
And then, unfortunately, that they begin being persecuted by their own people. God is able to take your worst enemy and turn him or her into the biggest follower of Jesus Christ that you've ever seen. Some of you may need to hear that right now. Maybe you've got a family member who doesn't know Jesus and who gives you a hard time at every turn. Maybe there's somebody at school who gives you a hard time no matter what you do. And they give you a hard time about your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's somebody at your workplace that is constantly berating you, constantly haranguing you, constantly putting you down for your faith in Jesus Christ. Hey, it doesn't matter who it is. God can take your worst enemy. Hallelujah. He can take the person who seems to be the most heathen person in the world, and he can in one moment turn their life upside down and turn them into a follower of Jesus Christ. I know he can do that. Now, sometimes we get caught up into thinking that our battle is against flesh and blood, and, and we get to thinking that we, we are, are going to somehow, we've got to, they're attacking us, and somehow we've got to strike back. But when we realize that all of these folks who are constantly attacking us for our faith, God is attempting to get through to them. And one day, by His grace, He will get through to them, and He will turn their life around. The question is, is He going to be able to use us to do that or not? Scripture says to love your enemies, to pray for your enemies, to bless your enemies. It may be that your enemy is holding in his hand your biggest blessing. And unless you allow God to use you to help to reach your enemy, that blessing will never be released. God desires everyone to know Jesus Christ. And he even desired for Saul of Tarsus, who was murdering and imprisoning Christians. He even desired Saul because he knew that he had a work for Saul that no one else in the world could do. So the next time an enemy comes after you and attacks you about your faith, just picture them as Saul of Tarsus. And God, one day, is going to get a hold of their life and use them for His glory. So as Saul, verse 3, as Saul, as he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. God had gotten Saul's attention. In fact, verse 9 says, For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. God had gotten Saul's attention. Saul 
Some of you have heard this story. A lot of you maybe have, because I've shared it many times. But it's a story about my papa Frank, my great-grandfather. He died before I was born. But he was a great man of faith and a great man of prayer. He prayed three times a day. And he was a waterman and a fisherman up on the eastern shore of Maryland. And my papa Frank went out tonging for oysters one day. And he had a little mishap. When he was tonging for oysters, he opened his mouth and his dentures fell out. And kaploop went into the Chesapeake Bay. Now, those of you that are familiar with working on the water, oyster tongs are very, very long instruments. They're kind of like... Um, well, they're kind of like salad tongs, you know, you, you put them together to grip something. But with, with oyster tongs, you, you pull them apart up here and they go together down under the water. And they s scrape the bottom and pick up the oysters. Well, he was in deep water at that point in the Chesapeake Bay. And he really didn't know what to do. So he went back home, and he just went ahead and asked God. He said, God, you know I don't have money for a new set of teeth. Would you please, would you please, Lord, tomorrow when I go out tonging for oysters, would you please help me to find my teeth? And then he finished praying. He got up the next morning and went out with his buddies. And he told them that he was going to go find his teeth. Needless to say, uh, his, cous uh, his cousins and his friends were kind of laughing at him. And they were accusing him of having that old time religion and that holy roller religion and etc., a few, few other comments. But he went out in a boat with two or three of his other companions, and one of them was his cousin. And he went to about the spot that he felt like he was the day before. And he stopped and paused and prayed again, said, Lord, help me to find my teeth in Jesus' name. He put the oyster tongs down in the Chesapeake Bay, gripped them together, brought them all the way back up, and there were his teeth. In one swoop, he had brought up his teeth. Well, he got so happy that he just sweep, sweeped down with his hand, grabbed them out of the tongs, threw them in his mouth, and started shouting and praising the Lord and speaking in other tongues, and his it scared his companions on the boat so badly that they all jumped overboard and started swimming for shore. But they never teased him about his faith again. They knew that he had the real thing. God knows how to get our attention. Now another character comes up in this story, Ananias. And look down with me at verse 10. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Now in, in the Hebrew language, his name would have been Hananiah. And it means the Lord is gracious, the Lord is merciful. You may remember the name Hananiah because it was the Hebrew name uh, of Daniel and the three Hebrew children, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, you may have known Hananiah better 
from his Babylonian name Shadrach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were thrown in the fiery furnace. Well, he had the same name as Hananiah. And how did, An how did, how did Ananiah, Hananiah answer? He said, yes, Lord. Verse 11, the Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Now I want you to look at verse 12. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Wow. He has already seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming to him and laying his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, Ananias, in verse 13, uh, uh, kind of argues with the Lord at this point. Um, Lord, you didn't clear this with me ahead of time. That's my paraphrase. You went and showed him a vision of me coming to him, but you did not clear this with me ahead of time, Lord. In fact, he said, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went. We often talk about the faithfulness of God. But how often can God talk about our faithfulness. We sing the old song, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. We talk about trusting Jesus and how Jesus is trustworthy. But do you ever wonder if God talks that way about us? Fill up, fill up, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Fill up, fill up. Precious Philip, I don't know if God can trust me like that. I don't know if God can trust me to go show a vision to someone about me doing something before he ever consulted me. He showed Saul a vision of Ananias before he had ever talked to Ananias about going to see Saul. Why? Because he could trust Ananias to do whatever God said. Can he trust you to do whatever he says? Well, it's understandable if Ananias didn't go. I mean, Paul was breathing out murderous threats against all of the Jew Jewish people who were following Jesus Christ. And, and it would be understandable, wouldn't it, Philip, if, if Ananias had said no. Well, you see, that would have complicated the storyline just a little bit because he had God had already given a vision about Ananias coming to Saul. And so the entire Gentile world hangs in the balance over whether or not Ananias 
will be obedient. The entire Gentile world, world that Paul would open up with the gospel of Jesus Christ hangs in the balance with this conversation that's going on with Ananias. I wonder, has God ever had a conversation with you? Has God ever asked you to do something? And you may have uh, argued with him a little bit. Come on, be honest. Anybody else ever argue with God? Okay, it's okay. You can raise your... We're not going to bite you. I'm confessing too myself right now. Anybody ever argued with God? Come on, raise your hand. It's good. Okay, okay. Anybody ever argue with God? That's okay. It's biblical. It's biblical to argue with God. But it's not biblical after you've argued with God to then disobey. Because Ananias didn't have a choice. Because you see, when he answered the voice that spoke to him, he said, yes, Lord. And you can't say Lord without calling him master, without calling him the one that is authorized to give you orders. He is our master, our king, our Lord, our leader, and so He is the one who gives the orders. He is the one who is able to issue a decree and his royal subjects say, Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. How much can God trust you? How much can he trust? allow you to be involved in the intricate processes of his courtroom? Has he found a willing vessel in you? Or has he only found an argument? Many years later, after Papa Frank, me and Denise had just gotten married. And I had gotten a beautiful wedding ring on that day. The best covenant deal I've ever made in my life next to salvation was making a covenant to love Denise. But we were tubing over in Deep Creek in North Carolina. Some of you have heard this story as well. And as we were tubing down the creek, the water was cold. It's always cold. But it seemed like it was very cold that day. And when when your skin starts to interact with that cold water, all of a sudden everything gets smaller. Your hands get smaller. Your toes get smaller because it's ice cold water. And so when we were going down the creek, Denise was up ahead of me and I was behind and I was trying to navigate through a stretch without flipping over and I was grabbing rocks in the creek to kind of slow down a little bit. And all of a sudden, I grabbed a rock with this hand, and the rock just ripped my ring right off of my finger. And I, I hollered out, but Denise didn't hear me because of the sound of the, the roar of the water. And I finally hollered out and got her attention. And by that time, the water had already washed me down, uh, I don't know how far, considerably far down the creek. And she was even farther, and we stopped, and and we met up. I said, I lost my ring. I lost my ring. And both of us at the same time 
remembered the story of Papa Frank and how he had lost his false teeth in the Chesapeake Bay, but how God had given him his teeth back. And we just, in the middle of the creek right there, prayed and said, Lord, you helped Papa Frank to find his false teeth in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. You can help me to find my wedding ring. And that's what we're asking you to do in Jesus' name. So I trudged back up against the current, and I, and I got to the general vicinity that I felt like was probably the area that was where my ring had come off and the water was rushing down and I was up against the current and I prayed one more time and I stuck my hand down in that creek up to my shoulder and I grasped and with the first grasp I pulled up my wedding ring and I've still got it today. God is able to get our attention when He wants to. The question is, are we paying attention when God is trying to get our attention? Oftentimes, we go through life and we're kind of on automatic pilot. We're just kind of going through our daily things and we're, we're trying to get through our day. But all the time, all the while during the course of our day, it may be that God is trying to speak to us. It may be that God is trying to show us something. It may be that God is trying to wake us up from the doldrum of our everyday existence and to speak a word of life into our lives. We've got to keep our ears tuned. Tuned to what the Spirit is saying. Tuned to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. So that when He speaks, we not only are able to listen, but we are also able to obey. Because what good is it if we hear what the Spirit is saying, but then we do not do it? We must be doers of the Word, not just hearers only. That's what James said. We can't afford to just be hearers of the Word. We must also be doers of the Word. And so... Ananias responds by going. Verse 17, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias was faithful to hear the word of the Lord and he was faithful to fulfill what God asked him to do even though it could have cost him his life, even though because Saul was had authority to to bring him back to Jerusalem and to put him on trial in Jerusalem, he went anyway and he was obedient to the voice of the Lord. And because Ananias was obedient to the voice of the Lord, Saul of Tarsus was one to Christ, was baptized, was filled with the Holy Spirit and became the greatest missionary of the entire New Testament church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, Ananias said that he came not just so that Saul could see, but that Saul could also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't go into detail about everything that happened that day, but we know that Saul 
was filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Turn over to Acts chapter 13. And as, they, as they're on their travels with Barnabas and Saul, verse 6 says, They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun." Now look what happened. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Does that sound familiar? He looked for someone who could lead him by the hand. He was struck blind, and he looked for someone who could lead him by the hand. Well, that's exactly what happened to Saul. He was struck blind, and he was led by the hand into Damascus. What happened with Saul? Saul was so filled with the Holy Spirit that he knew how to get this man's attention, this sorcerer's attention. He knew that God could strike him in his mercy and in his grace. He could strike him to also be blind and to be led about, led by the hand, led about the courtroom of the king, not the king, the the proconsul, so so that he could also be saved. Sometimes... God's mercy looks a whole lot of like judgment. Has anyone ever experienced the judgment of God in your life? Only three of us? Has anyone ever experienced the judgment of God in your life? Well, God, those that haven't raised your hand, God must not love you very much. Because He disciplines Those that he loves. And so if we're ever going in the wrong direction, God knows how to get our attention. Even if it means striking us down and striking us blind and whatever it means, he knows how to get our attention and he knows how to stop us from going the wrong direction and to steer us in the right direction. Oh God, I pray that you would smite us in your love and in your mercy and in your grace, discipline us, oh God, so that you will be able to stop us from going in the wrong direction and start us going in the right direction. So God knows how to get our attention. So it said here that Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18, It says, I thank God, this is Paul's talking, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So we know that Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. God empowered and equipped and enabled Saul to be the great missionary of the gospel to the Gentiles. But first, he had to get his attention, and he also had to get the attention of, of Ananias. I don't have a big fancy altar call plan for today. What I have on my heart is this question. How is God trying to get your attention? Right now. I went on my morning walk yesterday morning and it seemed like there were doves everywhere. There were more doves out 
Jerry and Mary, there was more doves in our neighborhood than I've ever seen before. I mean, they were cooing up here. They were on the roof, on the roof of my neighbors up here. They were in the trees down here. In fact, I, I rustled. I came up on uh, one three different times on three different circuits, and it was down by the road, and it rustled up and, and flew away, but then it must have come back, and, and it, I rustled it up again. There were doves everywhere. And it seems like when we're walking through life, if we're not careful, we can walk right past the dove, the Holy Spirit. We can walk right past the voice of the Holy Spirit. So often, as we're walking through our day, we just walk right past the voice of the Holy Spirit, and we're so busy, we're, such, we're in such turmoil, or we're, we're just trying to, to press through, or we're, just, we're dealing with this problem, or dealing with this attitude, or dealing with that person, and, and we're struggling, and we're just walking through, and if we're not careful, we'll miss the voice of the Holy Spirit who is trying to speak to us, who is striving with us. And so often, our ears just remain closed. But my prayer today is, Lord, would you open my ears to hear your voice in whatever way that you desire to speak. Lord, would you interrupt my day with the moving of the presence and power of your Holy Spirit? Lord, even if you must discipline me, even if you must correct me, even if you must, as it were, Strike me down, even if you must strike me blind. I hope you don't have to go to that degree, Lord. But Lord, whatever you must do, I want to hear your voice. I want to see your face. Lord, would you please get my attention? I'd rather you get it. Now, with my cooperation, than to have to enforce greater measures later. So, Lord, would you please get my attention and show me what you are doing? Show me where you are going. Open my eyes. Open my ears so that I will not miss your voice. Can you stand together with me? I'm going to ask that each one of us just make a little circle where you're standing right now. I'd like for each one of us to make that an altar. And I'd like for all of us, if we could, to bow in prayer. Are you willing? Are you willing to let the Lord correct you? Are you willing? to let the Lord get your attention? Are you willing to stop just blindly going through your day and to pause and to hear what the Spirit is saying? Let's pray together right now. Father, 
we're sorry for all of the times when we've walked right past your voice. When we haven't listened when you've been trying to speak to us over and over again. Father, we're asking, oh God, that you would speak to us now. That you would open our ears to hear your voice. That you would open our eyes to see you. Oh, Father, you know how to get our attention. Father, help us to pay attention. And Lord, help us to not just hear your voice, but to be obedient to your voice. Lord, even if you're asking the hard thing, even if you're asking the difficult thing, even if you're asking seemingly the impossible thing, help us in simple childlike faith to simply say, yes, Lord, and to go and do whatever you're asking us to do. Father, we don't want to be like Saul of Tarsus where you had to strike him blind. But Lord, if that's what it takes, so be it. We would rather be struck down now than to experience your judgment later. Father, we're thankful for Ananias and we're thankful that you found him trustworthy. Oh God, may we be found trustworthy. May you be able to go tell someone that we're going to do something before you've even checked with us. <laughs> so that and so that we will be able to be obedient to you. And simply say, yes, Lord. Can we say that together right now? Yes, Lord. One more time. Yes, Lord. One more time. Yes, Lord. Now let's lift our hands and praise to him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I know this has been a little bit different this morning, but I thank you for allowing me to share my heart with you. And, and I pray that our ears will be open to hear the voice of the Lord. If you come back tonight at 6 o'clock, I plan on sharing about Stephen, that man that was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. So, hope to see you tonight. God bless you. Have a blessed rest of your day.